Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. The talk we'll give tonight is in several parts, actually. It's um, called Living Well with Arthritis, Minimally Invasive Joint Replacement, Facts versus Hype. So the first part of the talk will be about living well with arthritis, things that you can do that don't involve surgery. And later on, we'll talk about different surgical options. And at the end of the uh, presentation, I'm going to introduce you to a patient of mine who recently underwent a type of knee joint replacement that was less invasive. And you'll have a chance to meet him and ask any questions about uh, his condition before, his recovery, and he'll have an opportunity to share his experiences with you. At, at the end, of course, there'll be plenty of time for questions. So first, a brief background on what is arthritis uh, and whom does it affect. One in three adults in the, in the United States have one form or another uh, of arthritis, and it seems to be on the increase. A million and a half people in the state of Washington have it, and there are really, it's, arthritis is not one condition. It's more than 100 conditions, although the most common one by far is osteoarthritis, which accounts for 80 to 90 percent. Some people call that degenerative joint disease, so you may have heard it referred to by that name. Uh, osteoarthritis and the other types account for nearly a half a million joint replacements per year in the United States. Arthritis can affect any joint in the body. Among the large joints, the knees and the hips are the most common, with the knees being more commonly affected than the hips. The way it appears is, as much as it does in the cartoon on your left, where the joint surface cartilage, which is the white shiny stuff that you see there and that you see on top of a chicken bone if you break one open, gets eroded through by a destructive joint condition. You can see it also in the hip with the normal hip on your left and the arthritic hip on your right with the smooth bearing surface on the left being what it should look like and the eroded and roughened surface on the right being what happens when it develops arthritis. Patients notice that they have it. Uh, when it presents gradually over time, sometimes with a visible change in appearance. The example I'm showing here is obviously rather extreme, but uh, and most people notice it well before it gets to this point. The symptoms that it causes is pain, typically with weight bearing, if it's a, a joint in the legs. Uh, if it's a joint in the arms, it can be stiffness or pain with particular activities. Again, stiffness is a hallmark of it, but pain is most commonly what brings patients to seek attention. Most people, before they come to the physician, even their primary care doctor will try a number of things, inclu including avoiding the activities that bother it, uh, rest, ice, uh, or over-the-counter pills. The diagnosis is one of the more straightforward diagnoses that we make most of the time. More than nine times out of 10, uh, a physician can tell that arthritis is present by simply taking a good history and doing a thorough physical examination and getting traditional x-rays, like the one that you see on your right. On the x-ray, on the left side of that x-ray, you see a black line between the thigh bone, which is at the top, and the shin bone, which is at the bottom. I'll see if I can get you an arrow to show you that. That black line that I'm pointing at is cartilage, which is see-through on x-ray. When the cartilage wears away, it gives the appearance of the bones getting closer to one another. And sometimes you hear people talk about bone-on-bone -bone arthritis, which is what it looks like when it's quite severe, as it is in this case. Very occasionally, blood tests are helpful. And that's for the less common types of arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. In those situations, referral early on to a rheumatologist who's a specialist in the unusual types of arthritis uh, is warranted and helpful. As I mentioned, the first part of our talk is how to stay active with arthritis. The recommendations vary a bit by joint, and I'm going to emphasize the area that, I'm most, that I most commonly treat, which is arthritis of the hips and knees. But as I mentioned, it can affect all the other joints. And in our question and answer session, we can certainly get into those other joints uh, if you'd like to. The bottom line is it's important to stay active with arthritis. And I want to share a few ways that you can do that. In general, what you'd like to do is to remain active, but also avoid high impact or high loading types of activities. Exercise is important, regardless of what kind of arthritis you have or what joints it might be affecting, both to keep the joints supple and flexible, but more importantly, or as importantly, to maintain good overall health and cardiovascular fitness, which can not just prolong life, but improve the quality of life. If you haven't been exercising and would like to start, it's important to check in with a physician if you have other health conditions that might interfere with your exercise regimen.
but in any case, to build up gradually, not to overdo it at first, which can be both painful and also frustrating because you'll find that you get more uncomfortable than when you started and it can actually discourage you from continuing. With respect to the joints in the lower half of the body, uh, I'll break it down between cardiovascular exercises and strengthening exercises. The cardiovascular exercises uh, are important, again, regardless of what type of arthritis you have or, or where it hits. If you've got arthritis of the hips or knees, it's often possible to work on a stationary bicycle or a regular bicycle if your balance is good. But sometimes people have trouble if the seat isn't high enough because the range of motion is affected early in those joints. If you keep the seat a little bit higher, again, try it first on a stationary bicycle for safety, you'll find that you'll be able to, to get through it pretty well. Uh, almost all patients with hip and knee arthritis are able to do this if the seat is kept high enough. Treadmill, on the other hand, is sometimes difficult because you're loading the affected joint. And that, most commonly, is what causes the pain. So most people will want to avoid the treadmill if they have hip or knee arthritis. But things like the stationary bike can sometimes help. Range of motion exercises, sometimes under the supervision of a physical therapist or a trainer, other times on your own, are fine. Swimming or water exercises, I think, really are the best for people with hip or knee arthritis, and I want to spend a little more time talking about those. What I commonly hear when I bring that up to people, though, is that if they tried to swim, we'd have to call in the Coast Guard, or they don't have webbed fingers and webbed toes like ducks, and so it's not going to work for them. But what it turns out is even if you're not an expert swimmer, it's possible to get into the pool either in a supervised exercise class like water aerobics, or just on your own walking and jogging, sometimes with the floats like you see in that top picture using a kickboard, or even in shallow water using uh, upper, upper body aerobic exercises. And any of those things are possible for people who don't consider themselves strong swimmers and are good for maintaining flexibility and good cardiovascular fitness, even if the joints of the lower half of the body are involved because the water tends to unload them. A common question that I get is how can I tell if the pain that I'm having with exercise or the discomfort that I'm having with exercise is okay or if it's going to make things worse? It's hard to know without talking to an individual person, but in general, here's what I would say. Arthritis pain is often sharp and well localized to one part or another uh, of the knee or the hip. It's most commonly there when you're putting weight on the joint, and it tends to go away when you get off of it. Muscle fatigue, which is okay and actually desirable when you're doing exercise, is different. And that will show up as it's sort of a diffuse achiness above and below the affected joint that's clearly in the muscles and away from the joint itself and you will typically be able to associate it with the severity or the, the duration of the exercise that you just tried. It may actually last well after the exercise, and that's okay too, and that's why typically we recommend a recovery period after a good workout. Uh, when you're first starting out, it's a good idea to have a 48-hour recovery period. The next most common question I get is, if I exercise, will that make things worse? Well, again, it matters what the exercise is. Arthritis, as you saw in one of the first pictures I showed, the one with those erosions through the joint surface cartilage is an abnormal bearing surface. Like an abnormal bearing in a car or a truck, if you run it hard, it's going to tend to wear it further. So if you're loading an abnormal bearing with your body weight on a treadmill or with jogging, we might expect that it would cause the arthritis to progress. But movement without load or under a reasonable load is often very well tolerated and in most cases recommended. And that's why, again, swimming is a great way to start an exercise program or water exercises if you haven't been doing anything else before. In any event, some people aren't so concerned that it's going to make the arthritis worse, but rather that it's going to make it harder for it to get fixed. I have some patients who are really avid runners, and they say, you know, I'm OK if I continue running. It bothers me after I run. I know it's making things worse, as long as you tell me that you can still replace the knee sometimes down the road, sometime down the road. And the answer is that almost always we can, that even if it gets worse in the course of normal use or exercise, it does not tend to prejudice the result of future surgery, and it should not be a particular concern to most people. Again, if you've got unusual circumstances, this is definitely the kind of thing you'd want to talk uh, with a surgeon uh, or a physician one-on-one -on -one about. Big decision is, when is it bad enough to go get help? What I would say is, if your pain is interfering with your typical daily activities, walking, shopping, chasing the grandkids, or leisure activities that are important to you, it's worth checking in at least with your family doctor, especially if you've already tried the easy stuff, the over-the-counter pain medicines, rest, uh, changing your activity uh, regimen. Uh, at that point, I would say it's reasonable to at least check in with somebody. And most of the time, if you've got arthritis and have symptoms at that level, your family doctor may try a few things, but typically you'll wind up in the office of an orthopedic surgeon. You needn't fear 
that when you get sent to the orthopedic surgeon, you're going to get operated automatically. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, I only get to operate on about one out of every 10 patients that I see. So nine out of 10 patients who I see, we, we find some way to make them comfortable without surgery. I say fortunately or unfortunately. It's fortunate for the nine patients and uh, for the surgeons who want to have big houses and fast cars, you know, it, uh, you'd like to be doing more surgery. But uh, the bottom line is we can, we can make most people comfortable without doing surgery. Um, the initial line of defense is activity modification, weight loss if possible, using a brace in some cases, not very commonly. Some people would prefer a cane to other things, and that's certainly an option. We'll tend to unload the joint. Anti-inflammatories or uh, painkillers, analgesics, uh, are a good first line of defense for some people. I would caution you against using narcotic pain pills early on uh, because they tend to be habituating or addictive, uh, and they can cause other symptoms uh, that are as bothersome as the reason you took them in the first place. Some joints, some joints are readily injectable, the knee joint being one of the more common uh, joints. Uh, with knee arthritis, there are a number of different types of injections that we can try, uh, cortisone type shots or joint lubricating fluids. Uh, how to choose one over the other is something that we can get into in the question and answer if it's a topic of particular interest to you. But they both are commonly used for patients with arthritis of the knee. And most, many patients can get a beneficial effect, at least for a period of time, from one or the other of those types of injections. How do you decide when it's worth having surgery? Well, if you can't do that, you should rush. No, that's not, that's not really true. Most people can't do this, even in the best of health. And I recommend that people consider thinking about surgery, at least, if they've tried non-operative approaches and they still have pain that limits their self-care, their walking, their important leisure activities. But at that level, it's almost always a risk-benefit calculation. What I do is a quality of life type of operation. A joint replacement is a quality of life operation. It's not a life-saving operation in most cases. And so the patient has to make a very personal and very individual decision that is based on how much pain and limitation he or she has weighed against the risk that goes uh, along with any operative procedure. And in order to make that risk calculation, you really do need to work with a surgeon who's done a number of these before and does them on a regular basis because everybody's medical profile as well as their joint profile is a bit different. And so the risk profile winds up being a bit different. And so it, it turns into a very individual and personal discussion that you have with, a, with an experienced surgeon to decide whether the time is right for you to go ahead with surgery. Ultimately though, it's the patient's choice, not the doctor's choice. I've not yet said to somebody, you need to have your knee replaced. It really is if you're at the point where it's bothering you significantly and you'd like to try something to make it better and you understand this risk, then we would proceed. But it's not something that I've ever told a patient that they need to have. Most of the mobile joints can be replaced. By far the most common are the hips, which is the upper left, and the knees, which are the next two from the left. I've got an elbow and a shoulder up there just to illustrate the point, but those are much less commonly done. And now we're into the second part of the talk, which is how to decide what type of joint replacement, a traditional approach, or the so-called minimally invasive surgery. I'd like to give you a little background about minimally invasive joint replacement. I think at the outset, minimally invasive joint replacement is a misleading name. I'm going to use it because it's so commonly used now. But I don't think anything where you're making an incision over a major joint and putting in foreign material uh, that's as large as a joint replacement prosthesis can be really considered minimally invasive. The, there are always surgical risks to these procedures, and whether we can minimize them, that may be, but it, at no point does it become like having skin surgery or dermatology uh, procedures or anything that's minor like that. This is, these are real operations no matter how they're performed. So the minimally invasive procedure, you've got to decide is it a different operation or is it a different surgical approach? Are there potential benefits? And what are the risks, if any, that go along with the so-called less invasive procedure? Lastly, it's worth considering how long has the procedure been done and has it been tested in a way that we would consider scientific? What you've got in pictures there are two different knee replacements. The one on the left is the so-called less invasive or minimally invasive partial knee replacement. And uh, our patient who's going to be joining us later in the talk had one of these, and he can talk to you about his experiences. And right next to it is a more extreme type of a knee replacement that was done for a patient with cancer. And it involved a much more extensive dissection. Obviously, you can't compare the two. But they're both knee replacements, and so you've got to decide what the differences are. Starting on the hip side, I would say, in general terms, hip replacement is a complex and technical operation. You've got to be able to see things in 3D as the surgeon. They've got great success rates at 10 years, in, well in excess of 90%. And we've got 40 years of data to share with patients on this with the traditional approach. 
This is a traditional skin incision for a hip replacement. They used to be actually even longer than this, but this is a skin incision that I can make in virtually any patient without considering it really a minimally invasive anything. We go through the skin and spread, split, or detach muscles, and we repair what we go through. And we expect that the tissues that we spread or split will heal, and nearly always they do. The hip replacement implant, regardless of what type of approach, traditional or less invasive, uh, is the same implant. So really, with respect to hips, you're talking about different surgical approaches to the same operation. Most importantly, the surgeon needs to be able to see and get these components in um, without struggling, or else you're risking other kinds of complications. The position and the alignment of the components is directly related to the success or failure of the operation. With respect to loosening of the implants from the bone, an incidental or accidental fracture of the bone, or dislocation of the ball from the socket. And so we've got to ask of the newer approaches, is it just as safe? Even if the skin incision is shorter, is it going to be just as safe with respect to the longevity of the implant and the safety of the operation itself? The recovery from a traditional hip replacement usually involves three days in the hospital with daily physical therapy, and some patients will go to inpatient rehabilitation for a few more days. Most patients doing it through a traditional approach will walk using crutches or a walker, for anywhere between three and four weeks, and a cane for a couple of weeks after that. Many patients recover more quickly. Problems with traditional hip replacements, early on is about a 5% complication rate. Most of those complications are medical complications related to the heart or the lungs or bleeding. Um, later on, over time, there's about a 1% failure rate per year related to loosening or dislocation. None of the complications that I would consider major, and by major complication, I define that as a complication bad enough to make the person wish they had never met me. None of those complications are related to the length of the incision. Here's a minimally invasive approach that, I've, that I know how to do and that is commonly in use also. Um, on top, you see a three inch incision compared to a seven inch incision on the bottom. Uh, there are variations of this that, that uh, will use either two smaller incisions or slightly different positioning. But to a patient, it's one longer incision, one shorter incision, or two shorter incisions. It's a difference in what the skin looks like. And the question is, is there a difference in the function and how long the implants will last? At this point, we have very, very little data on the so-called minimally invasive hips. In fact, really, there's nothing published to date in peer-reviewed journals on minimally invasive hip surgery, despite the fact that probably everybody in the room has heard of it or seen it talked about. So nothing published yet. Doesn't mean it's wrong. Just means there's nothing published. When you're doing a less invasive hip, it's important to place the incision carefully. The deep approach, in most cases, is the same. I would describe the operation as much more technically demanding. A typical hip replacement takes me about an hour and a quarter, and this adds about 30 to 40 minutes, or almost 50% to my operative time if I'm going to do a shorter incision. To me, I'm not sure at that point if it's still minimally invasive, if it's lengthening the operation significantly. Some of the operations lengthen it even more than that. Here's uh, some, not video, but still photography taken uh, from a less invasive hip replacement that I did. You see the three-inch incision uh, on the left, the deeper dissection on the right showing the muscles. That white part is the point of the hip that you feel just below the belt line. Going in, now you're looking on the left into the canal of the thigh bone or the femur, and it's being entered with a, a reamer just as we would with any hip replacement to make room for the implant. There's a healed incision three inches in length and the same total hip implant that I would use in any other type of surgical approach. So the question is, and when I saw the, uh, it, the telephone booth picture reminded me of the picture of uh, four tall guys standing around a three inch incision. Um, the question is, because you can pack 40 people into a phone booth doesn't mean it's a good use of your time. Same thing here. Because I can do a hip replacement through a three inch incision, is anybody really benefiting from that compared to if I had done it through a more traditional approach? You have to look at the pros and cons. And again, anything that I'm telling you is a potential advantage, I think you should consider as only a potential advantage because it really hasn't been validated in the way that we would consider scientific, um, despite, again, its wide publicity in the media. Certainly, the one thing that I can say about it is it's more cosmetic. The incision is shorter. If you're wearing a bikini this summer, it's, uh, it's going to give you a better looking scar. The promises of shorter recovery time, uh, I think, remain still to be validated. Blood loss, some studies actually have shown more blood loss because it's a little bit more of a struggle to get in. Other studies uh, that are still not yet published have shown about the same amount of blood loss. In any event, let's assume all of that is true. Let's assume that I could shave the recovery by 50% by cutting the incision by 50%. And I think that's a, a theory or a hypothesis that's not tested. We still have no data on that. It's not been validated. 
And we, we know from hearing people talk in hallways at conventions, and this isn't stuff that's widely shared yet, it appears to me that the dislocation rate, the fracture rate, and the nerve injury rate may be higher in the shorter incision approaches. Still not sure, but we're starting to hear more people talk about it. This may be a function of us being early on the learning curve as, as surgeons. We've got 40 years of experience with one technique and two or three years with the other. So it takes time to get better at things. But at this point, I think it still needs to be validated. And I think one has to consider, are you getting a few weeks of benefit and are you risking years of harm? That being the case, why is it so popular? Why have we all heard about it? Why is it in Time Magazine and on King 5 News? A cynical answer to that would be, there's a marketing power to this. And that may be the answer, but I'd like to think more of my profession and of people in general than that. Another possibility is that these benefits may be validated. In time, we may see the recovery time is shorter and it's just as safe. But at this point, what I would say is we've got surgeon and patient enthusiasm trumping what we would call the scientific process, looking it over carefully, comparing it to more traditional approaches. The bottom line to me is it doesn't matter whether it's marketing or whether it's true but not yet proved. I think it's important to validate new operations scientifically and carefully just the way we would any other medical or surgical treatment. What I would say, again, the same rules apply as if you were introducing a new pill, a new operation, a new implant. And this is an editorial from Journal of Arthroplasty. Arthroplasty is, the, is joint replacement. That uh, I'll read it because it's, the text is a little small. Recently, several proponents of minimally invasive surgery have seen fit to make their approaches public without scientific scrutiny or publication in peer-reviewed journals. The role of this discussion, that is that editorial, is not to decide whether it's a good thing to do, but whether society is well served by surgeons going public before scientific analysis and peer review have taken place. Given the well-documented safety and efficacy of hip replacement, it's hard to conceive of a rationale that would support going public prior to careful analysis. What they're saying is we've got 40 years using the traditional approach with 90 to 95% success. Where's the fire? What's the hurry? And I think that's a legitimate and open question. Let's move over to knees now. Um, and it's a little bit of a different conversation there. Knee replacement is the most common joint that's replaced. Over a quarter of a million are done every year in the United States, most for osteoarthritis. Similar to hips, at 10 years, you would expect more than nine out of 10 knees to still be in service without any failures or problems. There are now less invasive versions of the knee replacement. Unlike the hip surgery, it's a different operation. On top, you see a total knee replacement with the metal and plastic components covering the entire ends of the bone. The bottom picture shows only half of the knee has been replaced. So it's, again, a different operation. And if you're only replacing half the knee, you might reasonably ask, what happens to the other half? The only people who can get the partial replacement are people whose arthritis is confined to that part of their knee. So this partial replacement is also called unicompartmental or one compartment replacement. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. Again, here are three different knee replacements. A three-inch incision, mini knee, or unicompartmental knee on the upper left. A traditional seven-inch incision, total knee replacement on the bottom and an implant on the right that was performed for a failed prior knee replacement that required an incision that was two feet long. They're all knee replacements. If you saw somebody in the grocery store and they asked them what operation they had, they would always tell you the same thing. I had a knee replacement. There's obviously a humongous difference here. And it's not just a difference in the surgical exposure or the incision placement. It's a different operation. What we know about it is that the unicompartmental or the mini knee, the one on the left, is, does in fact lead to a quicker recovery, and I'll share the, the data on that with you in, in a minute or two. Uh, it is a less invasive approach, but it's only appropriate for 10 or 15 percent of, uh, of the typical uh, knee practice. So 10 or 15 percent of patients with knee arthritis might be eligible for this approach, so it's not for everybody. So again, the question is, if you've got a knee replacement that's three inches long, seven inches long, or 24 inches long, does size matter? Again, so here's the recovery time and other issues with total knees. About three days in the hospital, like the total hip, most patients will have a few more days on the inpatient rehabilitation service. Then outpatient physical therapy, using usually a walker or crutches for between two and four weeks and a cane for another two weeks. Regardless of what approach you have, regardless of what operation you have, the most important factor that seems to be tied to outcome is the experience of the person doing the procedure. Is it somebody who does six or eight of these a year, or is it somebody who does six or eight of these a week? That makes an enormous difference, just as you would expect it would. What about the uni knee, or the unicompartmental knee? Most, the, most of these patients have a short hospital stay, two days or three days at the most. Most patients are walking independently, that is without even a cane by a week. Most do not go to inpatient rehabilitation, and most have at most a couple of weeks of physical therapy. 
You see there somebody seven years out and uh, with a very short incision. Again, you'll get very different results if somebody is doing two of these a week or two of these a month or two of these a year. And it's, it, that should seem intuitive because, uh, as you'll see from the surgical video later, it's a fairly complex uh, intervention. What I would say is if you go to the doctor hoping for a minimally invasive anything and he says, no, you really ought to have a traditional knee replacement, you should consider that the total knee replacement is, still has to be considered the gold standard operation. We've got data out into the second decade uh, with great results of uh, return to function, self-care, leisure activity, and non-contact sports. Here's a pro golfer I did. He's uh, on the senior pro circuit. He had both of his knees done the same day. The following golf season, uh, he made a quarter of a million dollars playing pro golf. So that's with traditional, not minimally invasive anything. So you should expect good return to function and good results regardless of what you get. So what about the new way? Is it different than the, the hip? Is, are there actually data? And uh, what can we talk, share about with that? So what I would say is we actually have studies on the less invasive partial knee replacements uh, in contrast to the hips. These have been well studied. They've been out longer. The partial replacement implant has been out over 20 years. And the surgical approach has been out for several years already with published results. There have been patient surveys showing uh, patients who've got a partial knee on one side and a traditional total knee on the other. Almost always they prefer the partial. It's a lower risk procedure uh, with respect to bleeding uh, and perhaps other risks. Uh, the recovery is about three times faster than a total knee. So I'm going to show you a quick bit of surgical footage of, uh, of uh, office footage of a patient who had both knees done on the same day using the less invasive approach. So he's a little bit less than two weeks out. And this is his gait with uh, two minimally invasive partial knee replacements done. Uh, again, the important thing to know is that the issues that I'm bringing up on the left of this slide in terms of the recovery time, you can see this, the surgical clips are still in place with the short incisions. So you know this is a very fresh wound. Um, but he's still walking great and giving you great motion. All of these things have been validated and published using the traditional peer review process that you would want for any pill or implant or surgical technique. So that's again with two partial knee replacements done less than two weeks prior to the video. What are the disadvantages? Well, on the total knee, the recovery time is somewhat prolonged out into six weeks. There may be somewhat higher surgical risk with respect to blood loss. Uh, it is a harder operation to revise if down the road it fails. There are disadvantages, though, to the less invasive operation or to the unicompartmental operation. The, the implant survival rate is about 5% lower than for total knees at 10 years. And that's related to progression of the arthritis, the unreplaced portions of the knee, as well as to loosening of the implant. It's not for every patient. So if, it's, if the patient is not well selected, in other words, the surgeon isn't experienced enough to know who should have it and who shouldn't, you'd expect a higher failure rate. It's also not for every surgeon. People who don't do a high volume of complicated knee surgery shouldn't do these only occasionally, because as you'll see later on, it's somewhat complicated. Both unicompartmental and total knees have medical risks, as you would expect. Again, the knee is not the same as the, as the hip. On the knee side, we've got published results. It's a fairly, fam fairly familiar technique. People who are good at total knees can easily train up on the partial knee. Um, whereas on the hip side, being good at traditional total hips doesn't necessarily make you good at the small incision hips. It's, it's a really fairly different set of skills. Uh, on the knee side, it's a different implant. And so it's got a higher performance or different performance. And it also leaves you with your own ligaments and cartilage. On the hip side, it's the same implant. So intuitively, you would expect that the best you're going to do is the same as a well-functioning traditional hip replacement, with the difference being at the front end on the recovery time. And if that smaller incision causes any compromise in the surgeon's ability to see or perform the operation, that small compromise may lead to a big um, failure down the road. Staying active afterwards. Staying active afterwards is the same as before. Low impact uh, and uh, pool and bicycling are, are terrific. Uh, rugby is not a good idea. So I want to share with you some surgical footage. This is a traditional total knee replacement. Each of these videos runs about three minutes. On, your, on the bottom of the screen now is his foot. Going into the screen is, is his head. I'm moving the knife up towards the upper part of the leg now. The exposure involves going through the skin and then in through the, the tendon around the knee and then moving the kneecap out of the way. What you see there is the end of the thigh bone now being entered with a power drill to allow us the opportunity to align all of our jigs that allow us to make reproducible cuts. One of the most important things in knee replacement surgery is getting the cuts just right, and it's done to the, to the nearest degree uh, in order to get the overall alignment of the limb to be just perfect. 
Here we are removing the arthritic ends of the bone, which you see are sort of are raw in appearance. And then we size the implants to fit each patient, and there are uh, typically between six and nine sizes, depending on which implant system is used. And this is a cutting jig for those of you who have made cabinets at home. It's, it's not a lot different than, uh, than going to your shop and making a cabinet. You get these things on, you got to make sure the jig is positioned correctly, pinned in place, and then you're using surprisingly similar types of tools that you've got in your shop in order to, to make reproducible and reliable cuts. Here we are removing the arthritic ends of the bone and exposing a chamfered cut. And again, for those of you who make cabinets, it's, it's the same types of cuts that you'll see uh, in, in a uh, cabinetry shop. So here we are making the final cuts on the end of the thigh bone, using the jig to make sure that the saw is positioned exactly where we want it, and it's really down to, to within a millimeter or two. When you remove the jig, and this, the, that's the metal part there, will come off in just a second, you see the ends of the bone have been cut. Now here is an alignment guide on the shin bone, and again, the key thing that we do during surgery is get the alignment just as perfect as we can. Just like hanging a door, I hate to come back to the same analogies, it's, um, you want to make sure that if you were to drop a plumb line from the top of your door to the ground, it's, it's square, it's true. And the same thing goes when you're preparing the tibia or the shin bone. It's got to be a perpendicular cut in order to allow it to, to bear weight normally and to expect to have uh, long survivorship uh, of the implant over time. So we check and double check and triple check. There's a loose piece of cartilage that came out of that person's joint, which is common in arthritis. Once you make the cuts, you put on trial components to make sure that the ligaments are balanced and that the range of motion is just as perfect as it can be. Many people with arthritis have loss of motion, and we want to make sure that we get them that motion back. So before we put the real components in, we put in trials to make sure that the size is exactly correct and the ligament balance is right. This is the kneecap showing, and we remove the arthritic portion of the kneecap, again using a saw, measure it with calipers down to the millimeter, and then drill for pegs to replace it with an artificial joint surface part of the kneecap. We'll put on a trial kneecap and take the knee through a, a range of motion to make sure that the kneecap tracks or rides centrally over the front of the knee. There's the trial kneecap. The last thing we do is allow for a stem and some room for cement around the components. We wash the ends of the bone to get any, any debris. There's the, the real knee replacement showing. That's the, the tibia or shin bone side of it. There's the femoral or thigh bone side of it on an inserter. And then after we wash and dry the ends of the bone, oh sorry, there's the, the kneecap, which is made out of a high performance polyethylene resin. We will insert cement using a caulking gun, much as you would if you were caulking a window, and put it in under some pressure, remove the excess, and allow it to harden. They get put in with a, with a mallet to make sure they're fully seated. Here's the end of it with us putting in the kneecap, removing the excess cement, washing it to decrease the likelihood of infection. And there's the final replacement in place. The materials are cobalt chrome on the thigh bone. I'll see if I can get you an arrow to show you that. Uh, there's a bearing surface which doesn't project clearly. It's that white, which is a high performance polyethylene. It's the same material that's used to line coal chutes because it's very slippery and very durable. And then either a titanium or a cobalt chrome tibial component. Most of us are cementing all three components these days. And over here is the polyethylene patellar component flipped out of the way. When we close the knee, we'll flip it back in place, and it'll look and feel like a regular kneecap from the front. So here's about three minutes of surgical footage on the less invasive or uh, unique compartmental or partial knee replacement. So in contrast to that long six or seven inch incision you saw me draw before, I'm marking out now a three inch incision that's offset to the side where the arthritis is, in this case, the inside of the knee. On your left is the foot, on your right is the head. Entering the knee as before using a scalpel. Coming through the deeper tissues to get us a good view of the knee. In order to, have, to do a partial knee, you've got to have only one part of the knee, and the red part there is where it's arthritic, where I'm pointing to. The rest of the knee has to be fairly pristine, or else you would expect to have continued problems such as pain in other parts of the knee. A little bit more deep dissection to get us a good view of the opposite side, which is shiny and white and not at all arthritic. Entering the end of the thigh bone with a drill as before. And you'll see that it's the same idea. We're using jigs. We're taking care to get the alignment just perfect. Same types of instruments, but everything is a bit in miniature. 
and designed to give us uh, a shot at getting the, the alignment just perfect through a keyhole of an incision rather than a big wide exposure. You'll notice also we don't flip the kneecap out of the way, which I think is the biggest reason why the recovery is quicker for this operation. We're not disrupting as much muscle or tendon around the knee joint. There's the alignment rod coming out, a guide to allow us to make perfect chamfer cuts on the end of the thigh bone using a saw. Removing the arthritic ends of the bone just as you saw us do before. And once again, you want to get the alignment just perfect. It's got to be uh, true or perpendicular to the weight bearing line. And so we've got an alignment rod going down the shin bone just as we did in the total knee. But we're removing only half of the top of the tibia, the arthritic half leaving the important ligaments of the knee and all of the patient's cartilage on the uninvolved side alone. And I think that's a big part of why these are the preferred knee. It really feels more like a normal knee. You size it, verify the alignment, and then put in trial components just as before to make sure that the ligaments are well balanced and that the knee gets a good range of motion. So here we are putting in the trial component on the shin bone or tibial side, the trial or practice component on the thigh bone side, and taking the knee through a range of motion on the table and making sure that it's stable from side to side. You can see there's really quite a difference in the size of the incision compared to the other one. This is the component that's going to go on the thigh bone. You can see it's less than half as big as the total knee and the same thing on the tibial or shin bone side. You'll also notice there's no kneecap component here because the kneecap is not involved with arthritis or else this wouldn't be the correct operation. Inserting it with cement just as before pressurizing the cement into the bone to make sure it gets a good lock against the patient's own bone. Putting the components in, removing the excess cement. And then you allow the cement to harden. At the end of it, you see that white plastic just as in the total knee replacement. And we'll verify one final time that the range of motion is just exactly the way we want it, that they get full extension, good deep flexion without any difficulty. Surgical closure is just about the same as the knee replacement, but it's uh, much less involved because the incision is less than half as long. So to summarize, what I would leave you with is rather than focusing on which surgical approach you're going to get or which implant you're going to get, I think the key first decision is to find somebody who you trust, who's been well recommended to you, who's got a lot of experience in whatever techniques might be necessary, and all of the techniques that might be necessary. So every reasonable option is available to you. And I think that that's the first decision and the key decision is to find somebody who you trust who you can have this conversation with, who's not going to do a procedure on you because it's the trendy procedure that you read about in Time Magazine this year, but rather the, a person who spends time studying what's been published and what's been validated scientifically. Um, know that if you go there to get a minimally invasive whatever, and it turns out that the surgeon suggests that you get a traditional whatever, that traditional knee replacement, traditional hip replacement have a 90% plus survivorship or track record uh, at, uh, at the end of a 10-year period. You would expect good pain relief and return to function. There's our pro golfer again. Good functional, good functional improvement. And that even if down the road you have a failure or a difficulty, revision surgery is nearly always possible. Less invasive joint replacement, I would say, and this is my opinion, on the hips, it's too soon to tell. I know how to do them. I, in fact, have taught people how to do them. But I'm withholding judgment on this until we have some more data before I integrate it into my practice on a more general basis. I have concerns about the short-term complications, such as the fracture rate, the dislocation rate, and the nerve injury, as well as the potential for long-term problems if the components aren't perfectly aligned. On the knee side, I'm a lot more comfortable with that because we've got data showing that the components are as well aligned with the less invasive approach as with the traditional approaches. And we also have data that validate our impressions about the recovery periods, showing that the recovery period is about three times faster with the partial knee as with the total knee. Um, in any event, I think patient selection for the partial knee is important, and the surgeon's familiarity with it is as important. The educational website at the University of Washington is called Orthosource, and it has expert written content on hip replacements, knee replacements, but nearly 200 articles on other topics as well that pertain to musculoskeletal health, surgical procedures, and diagnoses. It's available as anything on the net 24-7. We've got educational videos uh, that you can uh, stream on the web. It gives you links to other, sor other sources. We also have an, a natural language search engine that I recommend you try. You can type in your questions in plain English, and it'll help process them using artificial intelligence to get you to the content that's most appropriate to your question. 
uh, and there's even an online referral request process um, for some specialties. And the website there is www.orthop.washington.edu. My page is at the bottom of that, which is the same as the first, slash faculty, slash Leopold. That particular page has more content related to hip replacements and knee replacements. So at this point, I'd like to invite Mr. Robert Croy up to join us. He's a patient of mine from uh, a little over three months ago who had a minimally invasive partial knee replacement. And we'll have a little chat up here, and we'll uh, take your questions at that point. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming, Mr. Croy. So this is Robert Croy. We're, I'm very, very pleased and privileged to have him come here and join us tonight. Mr. Croy is 64, and we did a minimally invasive unicompartmental or partial knee replacement on him a little over three months ago. Right. I thought maybe you could share with the group what it was like for you before you had the surgery. I had uh, arthroscopic surgery on my left knee five years ago. And the surgeon came in the, uh, in the room and said uh, he had to take all the cartilage out. So now I'm a candidate for a knee replacement. Since the surgery had removed the cartilage only on the interior portion of my left knee, I was a candidate for the surgery. I had gone through two series of three Synvest injections. The first, the doctor that, that uh, gave them to me, said I had done better than any of his other patients with it. And it lasted almost a year until I went skiing. So we went to the hospital on the 29th, a Tuesday, and I woke up in the recovery room and I thought, God, my knee is very smooth. I ex don't know what I expected, but I didn't expect it to be so smooth like that. And the fact that I could move it as well as I could. So as soon as I woke up, I felt really good about it. And the next day, I, they had me up in a walker. And the next day, I went home on crutches. Uh, three weeks later, I was fishing at Westport. And uh, it's been doing great. Can you describe a little bit for the group what, where the pain was that made you want to get this done? It was all on the inside. And what sorts Work. of activities brought it on? And it was it's bone on bone. Yeah. When did you feel it in the course of a typical day? All day. As soon as I got up, it was hurting. And at the end, uh, it, climbing stairs was particularly painful. So in terms of the pain pattern, has it changed for you, or how has oh, it changed for you? Yeah. I was walking without a cane in, in six days. I was working out on a stationary bike in seven days. And uh, I've continued to work out. A uh, month and a half after the surgery, I uh, volunteered to work in a fish hatchery in uh, northern British Columbia. And I was crawling over logs. and and that carrying fish in sacks to the, to the ponds. And, uh, Skinny little light fish, right? Don't tell me you're tearing, carrying big heavy fish, right? <laughs> I was carrying <laughs> big silvers. Oh my goodness. Okay. So yeah, we're probably talking 30, 40 pounds. Uh, it was amazing. And the people that were there couldn't believe I'd had knee surgery a month and a half previously. If you would just sort of show the group how it is for you to get up out of a chair, be able to yeah, just. It's just, I have full range of motion. That's great. That's great. Well, maybe you've got some questions for Mr. Croy. I had a feeling there would be a lot more questions for him than there would be for me, because he's the one who's been through it, and I never have. So. Uh, how, how long was your recovery? How, how long did you feel as though you were in recovery? And, and what were some of the things that you did during that period of time? Uh, actually, I, I was back to work uh, the following week. And uh, I'm a salesman, so I'm in my car, in and out of my car, going into clients' offices. And uh, I, uh, I felt after I put my cane down that, you know, I still had some swelling left, but, uh, you know, I'd move my leg back and forth just to make sure that the range of motion was, was increasing. And uh, it was just a piece of cake compared to what I had thought of. Other questions for Mr. Croy? Okay, you have to um, be like at your optimum weight for partial knee replacement um, type thing because my pain is the same place. It's on the inside of the right knee, but you know, I'm, I would need to. So the, the question is, uh, do you have to be at your optimum weight in order to be a candidate for a, a partial knee replacement? And the answer is you don't necessarily have to be at your optimum weight. 
but people who are very, very heavy may not be good candidates for the partial replacement. Um, there is relatively less known about that operation in very, very heavy patients, and I'm a little reluctant to do it in very, very heavy patients because it's a smaller implant and the amount of surface area that has cement on it is that much smaller. And so I'm concerned about the longer term uh, durability of the point of attachment to bone in patients who are very, very heavy. There are published data going up to 250 or 280 pounds, but I will typically cut it off well short of that. Other questions for Mr. Croy? Strengthening the knee muscles is, and the muscles around the knee is, is, is a great help for an arthritic knee, but I mean, if you've got bone on bone, pain, how is that going to help? I think that that's a, a good question and a good observation. All right, in general, muscle strengthening and conditioning, as I mentioned before, is good and helpful for many reasons. There are a few studies showing that the pain pattern uh, in arthritic knees is improved by, by improving the strength of the muscles around the knee, but I would say that in general, those studies probably apply best to, pati to patients with less arthritis rather than more. Patients who are in the condition that you described as bone on bone, in my experience, don't tend to get significant reductions in their pain by strengthening the muscles around the knee. Still good to strengthen them, may still make the recovery a bit easier. Uh, certainly overall fitness is never a bad thing, but I don't think it's likely to change the pain pattern much in somebody who's in that bone on bone condition that you described. I think your intuitive observation there is right. Yes, ma'am. I've had a total hip replacement this February, and it um, looks like the other hip is starting to uh, wear down quite a bit, and I'd like to avoid the second surgery. Um, could you talk a little bit about glucosamine chondroitin and any research that might support um, maintaining the hip joint? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I'll repeat it in case anybody didn't hear it. Uh, it's whether uh, glucosamine and chondroitin is likely to preserve uh, a joint that's known to be arthritic. Is that a fair restatement of your question? Okay. Um, glucosamine and chondroitin are nutritional supplements. Glucosamine and chondroitin are components of your own cartilage, which is one of the reasons that people became interested in using them as supplements. They are nutritional supplements. They are not medications or pharmaceuticals, and so they're not regulated by the FDA, and that's something to know about them. Doesn't make them bad or good, just makes them what they are. Um, they have been actually pretty well studied. And what we know about them at this point uh, is the following. About two-thirds of patients who try them notice an improvement in their pain pattern. That two-thirds is better than the placebo arms of most of those studies where they've been compared. In other words, the studies compared glucosamine or chondroitin or both to placebo or sugar pill or pills with no active ingredients. And the people who took the supplement had a greater reduction in pain than the patients who took the placebo. So there seems to be some effect from these nutritional supplements. That said, there has been no reasonable evidence at this point to show that they regrow or refresh or renew the cartilage as some of the commercials say that they do. So they're doing something. We aren't sure what that something is, but that something does seem to be reducing the pain in about two-thirds of patients who are trying them. In terms of the specific question of whether they're preventing the arthritis from progressing or uh, maintaining that arthritic joint surface or the thickness of that cartilage, that seems not to be the case as far as we can tell at this time. There were some very preliminary animal studies that uh, suggested that there might be some preservation of cartilage. I would say those are not well validated and there's certainly nothing in humans to suggest that that's true. That said, if my patients could take something that would make, give them a two-thirds chance of feeling better, I think that's terrific, okay? And whether, whatever it's doing to the x-rays, I don't treat x-rays, I treat people. And if the patients are feeling better, I'm not so interested in if the x-rays are staying the same. As long as the patient's doing fine, I'm not going to do surgery uh, regardless almost of what the x-ray shows, uh, except in very rare circumstances. So I think it's, uh, it's a good option for many people. Uh, an additional benefit to them is they seem to have very few side effects uh, and very few risks of taking them. The disadvantages are that they're not regulated by the FDA. They're somewhat pricey and they're not typically covered by insurance. And um, because they're not, perhaps because they're not regulated by the FDA, you don't always know that what it says is on the bottle is actually in the pill. And from time to time, consumer reports and other groups will do uh, studies to, to try and validate what's, what's in the pill, if it's indeed what, what it says on the bottle or not. So they're reasonable for many people to try. They seem not to change what we call the natural history or the likelihood that the disease will progress. But they do seem to help many people who try them. Other questions for Mr. Croy? Okay. 
anything? We can, I can take some more questions. I think there's still some time. But want to, before I do that, I just want to thank you. This thank is really you. wonderful. OK, over here. I had two questions. Um, one was, do you, can you do partial replacements for kneecaps? And the second one is, is there an age limitation at which you won't do a, a re knee replacement? For example, I've been told that I'm too young and that my, the knee will, um, I might, if I have a knee replacement, that in 10 years I might have to have another one and the second one never works as well as the first one. Okay, two good questions. Um, is there a partial replacement for the kneecap? And I'll answer that one first. Um, there is. There is a partial replacement. It's not for the kneecap only. It's for what we call the patellofemoral joint, the joint between the kneecap and the thigh bone. What we know about those is the following. There have been several uh, generations of that surgical technique. None of them to this point have worked particularly reliably. Um, the reasons for that are, are numerous, but at this point there isn't what I would consider a reliable patellofemoral replacement. There are ones that are FDA approved, there are ones that are in use, but they don't offer the same success rate as, believe it or not, doing a total knee replacement for isolated patellofemoral arthritis. This may change, and there may be particular patients where that doesn't apply, but for the general case, at this point, patellofemoral replacement or replacement of the kneecap and the mating surface on the femur is not a particularly reliable approach. The second operation is, is there an age, the second question is, is there an age limit to knee replacement? And there are no hard and fast rules, I wouldn't say, uh, but what I, I have this conversation very frequently, as you would imagine, um, as the boomers are aging, um, there are more people developing uh, arthritis. And the other thing that's feeding into this is, uh, is our problem with weight as a society tends to cause arthritis to, to present younger. That's obviously not the problem of the person speaking over there, but for other people it, it can cause it. Um, there are no hard and fast rules. What you need to look at is what's the likelihood of the knee to last a certain number of years. Uh, and so if you have a sense that a knee replacement will last Let's make it a round number, 90% chance that it's going to still be in service at 10 years. That means 10% of people who have that operation have been revised or reoperated in the first decade. Let's say that number goes to 25% by the end of the second decade. You know, so you're giving more of them back still in the second 10-year period. If you are 35 or 40 years old, getting a decade or even two decades doesn't sound like a real long time compared to if you're 75 years old when you start this. There's no way to, to make a generalization that's going to apply to every person in the room or every person in a practice. You just have to know that the younger you are, the greater the likelihood is that the operation is not going to last your lifetime and that you'll need to have it redone. What I would say is the more of those reoperations that you have, in general, the worse your prognosis is. The complications are more common in the reoperations, and the performance of the reoperations is often not as good as the first time joint replacement. This is so much the case that when I talk to my very young patients, my patients in their 40s, I will have a conversation with them that goes along the lines of, you're mortgaging your future against your present. We may be able to get you a good decade or two now, but it may be at the expense of something very, very bad that happens later on in life. For example, if you have a number of reoperations and one of them becomes infected or doesn't function mechanically well, you may look back and wonder if you couldn't have held off a couple of more years. So in general, for my very young patients, as long as you can hold off, it's better to. Yes, sir. Terrific question. I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Um, is there any advantage to getting both knees done at the same time? I'm going to rephrase that question a little bit so I can uh, make it a bit more general. And that's, what are the pros and cons of doing the knees together on the same day? This is a, is a very common question since somewhere upwards of a third of patients or more have arthritis in both knees if they have it in one. And so there comes a decision, do you want to do them both the same day or do you want to have one done, recover from that, and come back at a later date, some months later usually, and get the second one done? Like everything else in life and in surgery, there are pros and cons to, to each approach. The advantages of doing both knees the same day are that you only go through the recovery once and that overall that recovery period is a bit shorter. You're, if, you're, 
if you're doing them both the same day, you're, you're recovering them in parallel. In other words, you're making progress at more or less the same rate, so that at the end of that six-week recovery period that we talked about earlier for knee replacement, instead of having just one done, they're both going along at pretty much the same rate, maybe a little slower, but not a lot slower. You're, you're mostly done, and the whole thing's behind you. That's advantageous for people who want to get back to work. That's advantageous for people who don't want to take a large number of months to recuperate from having two surgeries staged several months apart. And it's advantageous, I think, for people who have emotional issues about surgery, who are concerned that if they do one, they may be so upset or traumatized or put off their game that they don't come back and get the second one done, and so they never realize the benefit that they could get from having them both done. The disadvantages of doing both knees the same day is that it's a much bigger operation. It's, you know, it's nearly twice as long if you're going to do them in sequence. Uh, and even if you do them simultaneously, in other words, if you've got a partner who's just as good at the operation as you are and you can do them together and you accept the risks of that, it's still a bigger hit physiologically. There, uh, this is quantified. In other words, we've got numbers on this. And what we know about it is, is the following. There's a much higher risk of needing blood transfusions if you get them both done the same day. There's a higher risk of cardiac or pulmonary complications if you get them both the same day. If those risks were doubled, well, we would say that's a push because you have to come back anyway. It's actually more than double. Not tremendously so, but noticeably more than double. And so what I tell patients about this is if they've got one of those reasons to get them both done, if they really, for social or personal or work reasons, um, don't want to take that kind of time to recover, and they don't mind some increase in the medical risk of surgery, then doing them both the same day may be reasonable, provided that they're fairly healthy. If the patient has a large number of medical problems uh, or says to me, I really want you to take the risk as close to zero as you can make it, I recommend separating the procedures by a few months. So there's pros and cons to each. I have that conversation with everybody who asks the question, and what do you think happens? About half the people go one way and about half the people go the other. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's almost a personality screen for people who are either risk averse or pain averse. I want to thank you guys for coming. I really enjoyed spending the time with you.